Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the LSE. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be chairing the annual British Journal of Sociology lecture for 2015. This event has been running for more than a decade now with a series of distinguished speakers who set out their own vision of the most significant questions and debates within their own area of the discipline. Each lecture is published in the journal's uh, following March issue with a set of responses to it by other scholars within that field. So look out for that. Uh, tonight's speaker is Richard Swedberg, who is a professor of sociology at Cornell University, having previously been at Stockholm University. Richard will be known to many of you as the author of outstanding books on key figures in sociological and economic thought, Joseph Schumpeter's Life and Work, published by Princeton in 1991, Max Weber and the Idea of Economic Sociology, also published by Princeton in 1998, and Tocqueville's Political Economy, Princeton again in uh, 2009. These are books of tremendous scholarship and authority, thoroughly researched and elegantly written, and they mark Richard down as a superb historian of ideas whose interpretation of classical, social, and economic thought will influence our discipline for many years to come. But to many of us, Richard represents far more than this, because for more than two decades now, he's played a leading role in the rejuvenation of economic sociology in the US and Europe. He's edited and co-edited a series of key handbooks and readers in the field, such as the Handbook of New Economic Sociology, which was originally published in 94. And in Europe, he was the founder, or one of the founders, of the Economic Sociology Electronic uh, Newsletter, which still thrives to this day as a platform for, for bringing together scholars across Europe in what would otherwise be a rather disparate field. Richard has been tireless in his advocacy of economic sociology, quietly and sometimes not so quietly, encouraging and cajoling colleagues to develop their work in ways that, in his view, would have a lasting impact on the field. Richard knows and reads everyone, and is unfailingly generous and insightful in the advice that he gives. In 1987 and 1997, he published review articles that reflect on what has, what has been achieved in economic sociology, and these are now widely seen as the most authoritative sources of reference for anyone who wants to understand that field. When I invited Richard to give this lecture, I wondered whether he might wish to add further reflections on the state of economic sociology today, or perhaps talk on the politics of the Eurozone, which I know is a topic that exercises him greatly. But with insight into the purpose of our lecture, Richard decided that he wanted to reflect on an issue that concerns the discipline as a whole, namely the status and purpose of theory. His latest book, The Art of Social Theory, published again by Princeton last year, advances an impassioned plea for rethinking our relationship with theory, <coughs> both in the way it gets practiced in relation to our research and, above all, in the way it gets taught. It is a great read, fully deserving of Mark Gronovata's description of it as vintage Swedberg, both for its erudition and its scholarly range. Richard will talk about his vision of theory tonight in a lecture entitled Before Theory Comes Theorizing or How to Make the Social Sciences More Interesting. So please give a warm welcome to Richard Swedberg. Right, so thanks a lot for that introduction, and I'm very happy and very honored to be here and talk to you. So, uh, well, here it comes, the, here is the title, with a subtitle which promises a lot, how to make social science more interesting, we'll see what you think. Uh, so, since a couple of years, I've been more or less obsessed, I'm usually obsessed with what I'm doing, uh, with theorizing, and I refer to it as my project on creative theorizing. So, in 2012, I wrote my first article on theorizing. The next year, I put together a conference which was interdisciplinary, and that resulted in the book to the left, Theorizing in Social Science. So, there were you know, people from economics and uh, education and uh, sociology and so on. So the idea was to spread it a little bit around. And then in 2014, uh, and I hope you, you know, enjoy the, ha the, the nice cover, uh, it, well, I published The Art of Social Theory. 
So let me start out with what theorizing is. So you can define theory in a lot of different ways, but the way I'm going to define it here is, is that it's the end point of theorizing. So when you open a book, elementary forms or whatever, the presentation of self, you are really getting the theory and other things in the sort of end state. So what comes before that is really theorizing. So that's a whole process. So one of the basic ideas in this work is, is that that's really what you need to know. That's what you need to be able to do, the theorizing part. And you recognize, of course, that students are typically exposed to the theory part. And I mean, that's what the problem is partly, right? I mean, they take a theory class and gets assigned six books in theory. It's like, you know, you want to teach someone to write a play and you give them Shakespeare. You know, that's not the best way to start. You sort of like have to start a little bit easier. So of course, this opposition between theory and theorizing is to a certain extent artificial. It's to make a point. So as the third point here says, they of course, you know, organically united. But today in our, uh, the way we are teaching theory is that we are exclusively, I would say exclusively, uh, yeah. focusing on theory while we're not at all talking about theorizing. So what we need to do is to focusing in on the process before we come to the end point, the theorizing thing. And so ideally we want to know how you do that. And we want to be good at it. So you want to develop skills in whatever it is that you do to produce a good theory. Uh, ideally, you would like to be able to develop certain steps saying this is how you do it first, then you do that, then you do that. And once you know that, you can, of course, like when you learn to drive a car, you can sort of like do it unconsciously, you flip things around a little bit. But basically, we would like these steps. And you would, of course, like also to turn this into work habits. So when you have a project, you know, it's sort of that's the way you are approaching kind of thing. So, yeah. My sense is that, you know, the supremely talented people, of which I hope there are many here tonight, but I doubt there are a few supremely talented people, for them it comes automatically. For us normal mortal people, we have to sort of like learn this kind of stuff. So the hope, of course, is that if we train a generation, two generations, etc., in the theorizing, we will end up with better theory. Now, one of the nice things with a project of theorizing is that it has clear links to education, to educational theory. So here you can see the difference between teaching theory, which I've done for many years, and also teaching theorizing, which I've also done for several years. So teaching theory is that, you know, you teach the students what the theorists say. Presumably, or hopefully, you use original text instead of the baby food text that says this is what Marx said, etc. And the teacher is this enlightened guide saying, oh, this is what Max Weber means with the term Verstehen or social action or something like that. When you teach theorizing, it's a very different kind of game. I mean, now you want the students really to learn to theorize themselves. That's the point of it. And, you know, you also want them to do exercises. You know, you can't really read yourself to become a good theoretician. It's like swimming or biking. You know, you have to jump into the water up on the bike and keep your balance. And the teacher gets a very different role. You're not any longer this sort of enlightened guy. You're much more like a, you know, athletics coach. You're a little bit too old to play the game yourself, but the, you know, the students with a young, agile bodies, you know, you can teach them one or two things to be good at it. So, for, you know, this is not really a speech for the professors. I mean, they are sort of like, you know, you want to convince the students. So the central point is really always the student in theorizing. So, you know, a student, just like you have to be born yourself and you'll die yourself and you have to bike yourself and swim yourself. You have to theorize yourself also. So you have to sort of like deal with things like the fear of theory of the student. So we know biologically human beings are born with a capacity to theorize, you know, to invent explanations. So you have to, they're already doing it. So, you know, sort of like that's one way to approach it. You also have to teach a student, I think, to develop an attitude. It's very easy to be intimidated by the 1400 pages of economy and society and so on. So you have to teach the students to be confident enough to uh, start doing theory uh, themselves. Uh, sometimes people think that I would like all everybody to become like, you know, new, you know stars like Weber or Durkheim or Simmel. I think that would be great. 
But that's not what this is about. This is really about making the students to become capable in theory. Just like a student who takes a course in methods, you know, be it qualitative methods or statistics, is pretty competent after that in you know, knowing how to run a regression analysis and so on. You also want them to do the same with theory. Instead of coming out of the class knowing a smattering of Norbert Elias and Goffman and so on, they should basically know how to construct a theory. So I've written here that, you know, what you want to avoid is this trained incapacity. I think that's what we have today. And, you know, as I said, I've taught theory many to, uh, for a long time, so I'm sort of like part of the unhappy situation I'm trying to undo now. Here is a, a little bit of a different kind of terminology, which is sort of like good and gives you another angle into this idea of theory and theorizing. And it's the terms context of discovery and context of justification from the philosophy of science. So the terms were invented by Hans Reichenbach in the 1930s. And then they were sort of spread by Karl Popper. So here you can see the, what the context of discovery is in the form of a quote by Reichenbach. So it's the form in which thinking process is subjectively performed. So, you know, you're doing something and something happens in your mind. That's subjectively performed. And according to Reichenbach and Popper, this cannot be studied scientifically, you know. So the context of justification, that is, quote, the form in which thinking process communicated to other persons. So that means that once you have had your intuition, once you have had your insight, you have to, of course, translate this into the terminology, into the way that you proceed in your particular science. And so what we are having here, one reason why it's good to take up this terminology is, is that the students are all the time exposed to the context of justification. So even if they can sort of figure out that it's how you do, how you handle a theory, since all they read in theory is this last stage, there's no basic teaching in theorizing a theory construction these days, you know, they subconsciously are going to pick up on the wrong way to do theory. Now, to continue with this terminology is, is that with theorizing, theorizing has much more to do with the context of discovery then, and theory has to do a lot to do with justification. So what we would like, you know, my suggestion is, is that we try to focus more attention on the context of discovery, try to sort of like really focus in on that. Now I said that Reichenbach and Popper didn't believe that you could study, you know, these creative moments or the early thing. Well, we know today that there exists a whole, you know, industry of studies of creativity. You know, cognitive psychologists, etc., have, you know, done a lot of work for several decades in this area by now. That's not necessarily the kind of knowledge that we want. What we want is a kind of practical knowledge. When you get up on the bike, when you swim in the water, you are not really helped by scientific theories of what you are doing. You are helped by knowing what to do. So, of course, you can learn, once you have that insight, you can sort of learn a lot from these theories of these uh, studies of creativity that overlaps and so on and so forth. But basically, I think that in theorizing, you're interested in not a scientific theory, you're interested in kind of a practical kind of theory, that's what you want. I think that theorizing is extra important today, I mean, it's always important, you know, theorizing and theory goes together, and the reason for that is, is that I think since World War II, methods have advanced in a very quick, uh, at a very quick pace. I think theory has not. I always get in trouble for saying that because then people say, oh, isn't, you know, Luhmann and Bourdieu and Goffman wonderful? You know, in my mind, they're not really that wonderful, you know, compared to, you know, the real brains, the real brains around. But, you know, to make a sort of more, you know, to backtrack a lot, I can at least say that the literature on theorizing is practically minimal since World War II. The only thing that you have is for about 10 years you had mainly in the United States something called theory construction. You might know Arthur Stinchko's book, which is the most famous and the best in that, but that sort of like died. Now, one reason why methods became, had such a big breakthrough is also that, you know, you can teach them in a good way. And the way you teach them, be it qualitative or quantitative theories, I'm not talking, my speech today is about sociology in general, and, you know, it's that they use these exercises. So that is another, you know, reason for us to try to develop exercises in theorizing. That's the way to go, I will argue. 
So as a result of these, the methods really advancing very quickly. We are now mainly talking about quantitative methods. You know, the field research came earlier. That's the Chicago School, right? So, but they have developed very, very forcefully, and that has meant that there is an imbalance. You know, there's a lot of really good methods around. I'm not denigrating them, but there really is very little on theorizing and on theory. So, you know, you see here, for example, very little time is spent on theory and theorizing in research project. If you did a time study, that's what I expect you would find. Role of theory is often symbolic. I have many students who do their research and then it fails. You know, most, you know, researches are sort of like fail. You know, they're not very interesting. And then they come to the theoretician and they want help with it. And you're supposed to put it in the context and give it this kind of spice. That doesn't work at all, of course. Now, if you have this imbalance, you know, uh, what are you going to do? So my answer to that, of course, is that we need to focus on theorizing and we need to, you know, be able to develop a kind of educational technology, if you want, with the basic steps to follow. How do you do, you know, theorizing? Or if you want, sort of like, which are the main areas if the term steps doesn't appeal to you? Note that in order to do this, you also need, you cannot theorize without, it seems like a trivial point, but it's an important point, without a very sound background knowledge of social science and sociology. So what I'll do now, people often sort of like say, you know, like, I mean, how can you just say that people are going out and they're going to do observation, they're making their observations, then they do theory. How can they do this possibly? Well, they can do that because they're supposed to be trained in sociology before. So here are the steps, but I will just, I'll mention them, but I'll come back, you know, and talk a little bit more about them because I want to emphasize the role of this background knowledge. So the first step, of course, is observe, observation. You find that in Weber, you find it in Durkheim, you find it in practically all the major sociologists, except for, you know, theory-driven research, maybe by rational choice people or analytical sociologists, as they are called these days. So note that observation is not something that we would normally associate with theory, but that's how it starts. You cannot really theorize without observing. You then have to, when you're observing something, you have to name the phenomena. You know, you have to lock it in somehow. You know, so there is one sociologist who noticed that in the political arena and several other parts of society, there were some individuals who had this, you know, hypnotic effect on other people. He said, well, you know, I know a term from theology which I'll use. I'll call it charisma, you know. Once you have given a name, you have to sort of like start working up what you are doing. You can use and develop concepts. If you are really original, you can turn the concept, the name into a concept. The concept of charisma, if we continue with that. But of course, you can also bring in other concepts. You know, charisma, of course, is analyzed with the help of social action and so on, with Weber. You continue, and now you want to sort of build the theory out. You want a complex kind of theory. You don't want the Jungian sort of billiard balls. Here's the cause, here's the effect, boom. You want something in between. You want some kind of process in between here. And, you know, there are different ways of doing that. You can develop a typology, you can use metaphors, you can use an analogy. There are several of these kind of techniques to do that. So, you know, with Max Weber, he continued to work on the theory of charisma and added routinization. So now you have a process. You go from charisma to routinization. And then step five is to come up with an explanation. You know, that's sort of like the standard kind of uh, scientific model that you have. So, you can explain why this model goes from charisma to routinization or, you know, which we ever also did. You can explain what are the situations that, you know, create a charismatic kind of situation. So, but this is just a pre-taste, you know, an early taste of what these steps looks like or what, you know, what the things you need, what tasks you have if you think that the idea of step two following after step one, etc., is not very good. So what you need to do, of course, is that, you know, you cannot do theorizing in sociology be, be, without knowing social science and sociology. So people theorizing in everything. They theorize in biology and archaeology and law, you know, and so on and so forth. So we are talking about a specific thing, theorizing in sociology, possibly in social science and so on and so forth. 
So note within brackets that, you know, people are theorizing in all the different sciences, and that means that we can learn from all the different sciences because they're all pretty much different. There isn't one theory of causality. There are many different ones, you know. So Max Weber himself, for example, takes some ideas he finds in legal science and uses it for his own theory of causality in interpretive sociology. Legal scholars are very good on analogies. You can learn from that, etc. So, you know, that means that this theorizing project really has to have an interdisciplinary kind of dimension, which would be fun, you know, bringing people from different kinds of science. But for what we're talking about just now is that you do have to have this special background, special knowledge in social science, and we wonder what on earth is that going to look like? You know, how do you train people in having that? So a boring answer would be that, you know, you are being socialized into sociology when you're a sociology student. That doesn't really tell you anything at all. You know, here, more nicely put, is that by virtue of being a member of the community of researchers. Now, my viewpoint here is, is that, like with a lot of things in theorizing, is that you basically need to have a collective discussion of it. So I'm standing here shouting at you, you know, with a single person, right? So, but you really need to have a lot of people involved in this, particularly if you're going to, you know, develop successful exercises and so on and so forth. So in the meantime, since we are not having a collective discussion at the moment, you know, people are sort of like silent and doing, sociologists always do their own projects. The world can go down and they will continue. And notice that when I was during financial crisis, you know, practically no one wanted to study it, you know, at the time, because they all had these t projects like Titanics, you know, to try to move the direction of them. So I'll stick out my uh, chin and say what kind of knowledge you need. So one of the teachers I had was Everett C. Hughes. Everett C. Hughes is a famous sociologist. He replaced Robert Park as the leader of the Chicago School. He's incredibly smart, Everett. So Everett said that in order to be a good sociologist, you need two things. One thing is that you have to develop a sociological eye. His most famous work is a you know, two volume set of essays called The Sociological Eye. And that one, you have to have really deep knowledge. You really have to be able to walk into a situation and immediately look at it from a sociological perspective. Now that's different from if you are, for example, from law. In law, you want to develop a legal mind. You know, and so on in the different sciences. You do develop these different kind of perspectives. First thing then is to have this really deep knowledge. You should really take any situation and you should be able to just like that, you know, make a sociological analysis of it. What is that? Well, you know, look at the social interaction, look at the role of the group, look at the role of society. That's sociology. The second thing, according to Everett, that you need to have was, and this you didn't have to have at all a deep knowledge of, you should know a lot of concepts. And Everett thought that actually if you taught students the exact definitions of concepts, like if you think of chapter one in Economy and Society, where we have in basic sociological concepts, will really define concept after concept. Everett thought that was wrong, because the students would really sort of like, they didn't like that, they couldn't really deal with that. So you're supposed to have a lot of concepts in your mind, so when you go in, and you're now, you know, focusing in on some interesting interaction or group dynamic, you sort of say, is it this, is it that, then you should be able to sort of like pull out from your head uh, these different kinds of concepts. So that was how Everett did it. So now we're coming back here again to the steps. Assume now that we have a person who knows quite a bit of concept and who has the sociological eye. What do you do then? Well, the first thing you do, again, is to observe. And here, the point is really to learn something about the topic before you start theorizing. Sociologists are usually too quick, you know, probably having to do with this biological capacity to create theories. So here I have a quote by Wittgenstein, says, look, do not think, you know, that you really should hold off theorizing. Uh, you should just sort of like submerge yourself in what you want to study. Here's a cute quote from, uh, you know, Sherlock Holmes. Why do you, what do you think it means, says, you know, the ever stupid Dr. Watson and Sherlock Holmes, the ever smart Sherlock Holmes says, I have no data yet. It's a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. Well, you know, 
Weber could have said the same thing, or Durkheim could have said the same thing. So then we come to the second thing, namely the naming. And there actually exists a literature on naming. You can find, if you look at it, Weber has an opinion on it, Durkheim has an opinion of it, and the person who all Brits should know, Ewell, you know, he has a long, long section of 150 pages in one of his uh, uh, works about naming. So that is basically how you look, lock in the identity. You come up with charisma. You come up with household work. You sort of like lock in the phenomena so you don't lose it. So the idea is not like a lot of students unhappily end up doing, is that you find something that is not totally new, but it's a bit is new, and then you squeeze it into already existing terms and thereby you know, you're losing what is interesting about the research and you're also sort of not pulling out what is your own kind of contribution. Use and develop one or several concepts. I mean, if you are really clever, you develop a new concept, but that, that is difficult. So usually you sort of like, a la Herbert Bloomer says in his famous article on sensitizing concepts, you sort of tweak the concepts a little bit. That's good if you can tweak it. You can create a hybrid. Every CU's created status contradiction, it took status and added contradiction. Just like you can see a number of concepts being built around role, role distance, role set, and so on and so forth. So concepts help you to sort of like tighten up the analysis, you know, and of course we know Max Weber is the famous, the ideal type, which is also a way of tightening things up to have a tool to play with. And then you try to build out the theory. So again, you really should know, if you are a sociologist, what a metaphor is. You should know what an analogy is, what a typology is. You should know what a classification is in order to try to build in movement into it. You really want that. The movement is very much linked to social mechanism. So you basically want to, the space between the cause and the effect. You want to build that out in a very clearly visible way. That's what the metaphor of uh, the social mechanism is about. And then, of course, you want to have an explanation. So, you know, I do not believe in this, that social science is about description. I do not believe that description is the same as an explanation. I think it should end with an explanation. But as you can see, you know, uh, these are difficult, many difficult questions that I'm raising. So there are many answers. Oops. Here we are. Right, so now what we're coming into is that I've so far talked a lot about what is theorizing. My project, however, is about creative theorizing. So I'm not really that interested in, you know, helping to provide another kind of technology or something like that for sociologists so they can continue to produce the rather uninteresting sociology that is being produced today. I'm more interested in sort of like releasing, trying to release the creativity that people have in them. And this idea about, this is my terminology, the pre-study and the main study is about that. So in my experience, by among other things, looking not only at colleagues but mainly at myself, is that what a problem for a lot of sociologists are is that they have a pretty good idea. You know, we all, now and then we have good ideas. And those are the ideas we want to do research around. And then you start doing the research. Now what usually happens is that once you do the research you find out things are more complicated than you thought. So now starts this struggle where you want to keep on to the original idea but reality is really telling you that it's more than that and as a result you know we get these kind of half-assed researches that we all know too much. So what the pre-study and the main study is about, what the pre-study is about is that before you do your research design, before you do the main study, before you throw in all your energy into doing this, all the money, all your extra time, etc., you should carry out what I call a pre-study. So a pre-study is a little bit similar as a pilot study or an exploratory study, you know, which are similar terms, you know, but, and I've consulted with Jennifer Platt, the great historians of methods. People don't really know too much what a pilot study or exploratory study are, but they're a little bit different from a pre-study because the pre-study is really there only to see if you can say something bright about the topic before you are throwing in your whole weight, and your whole weight is the main study. So the interesting thing with the pre-study is that now you are going for creativity. You are studying whatever it is, and you want to come up with some new ideas about it. So usually when you study something empirically, you have to use your methods, and you have to use them in a responsible, competent, professional way. Well, here you don't. Here, that's not the purpose. Here your purpose is to come up with ideas. So anything that helps you to come up with ideas 
is allowed here. So this is really, you know, the foyer albums, you know, uh, no method really here. So, you know, if you study something, you can use whatever material you want, dream statistics, you know, whatever, ask your grandmother, you know, whatever it is, speculate, have wild theories, whatever it is. So, you know, as I wrote here, this goes against the ethos of methods and surely the ethos of uh, science, like Merton says, etc. So, here you also, you can see the point here is, is that you can use a lot of things for heuristic reasons. And that means that you don't have to come up with something good. You can use metaphors that are lousy, you know. Is a firm the same thing as a plant? Well, that's stupid. But it actually, if you really try to work it out, you come up with some good ideas. You know, if you don't believe in certain kind of simple correlations, well, they can be very good to come up with an idea. That's the heuristic use of things. So you don't have to use things just because it doesn't fit there. So again, Max Weber says that, you know, in chapter one in Economy and Society, that, you know, functionalism is really a dead end. But, he says, it's indispensable to come up with ideas. So that's the heuristic kind of things. Now the problem, of course, with the pre-study is that it's totally unreliable. It has been designed to be unreliable. You don't know if you're sort of looking at some outliers or whatever, if you want to be more representative and speak more generally. So, you know, that's just the price you pay. But there also are ways to control this. There exist, you know, if you know Kahneman and Tverkis ideas about various kind of biases, you know, like the first thing you see, you know, really imprints your mind and so on. So there are some ways of uh, 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 working with, uh, w with the unreliability of the pre-study and still doing a pretty much a pretty good job. So that was the argument about the pre-study and the main study. And what I now want to do is, is that, oops, sorry, bumping around here. Uh, what I now want to do, and that's why I'm looking at my papers and losing the pace a little bit, is that I want to switch over to a related but a little bit different topic. And that is that if we accept that theorizing is good, you know, that it's important, we also realize that we need sort of a different kind of literature. There's a very well established literature in theory, what's classical theory, what's contemporary theory, which authors to read, etc. And we need to develop a similar kind of theory for theorizing. And so what I will do now for the next couple of minutes is to tell you about some of the things that I think are quite important with theorizing and some of the really smart people. And here is, you know, the person that I relied most on, which is not very much known in the United States. He's generally known as the best philosopher the U.S. ever created, but he's not read at all by sociologists, and I don't know if people in England does it. And that is the philosopher and polymath Charles Sanders Peirce. So Peirce is the founder of pragmatism. He's one of the founders of semiotics. He's a pioneer in experimental economics. He's a pioneer in experimental psychology. He truly is a genius, actually. You know, the man, he's one of the founders of modern logic, you know, about the caliber of Frege and so on. He's truly a genius. And his most popular notion, his idea, is the notion of abduction. And what does he mean by abduction? Well, we know induction, you know, from the bottom up, uh, and we know deduction from the top down, and so on. Well, according to Peirce, there was a third part in logic, and that was abduction. And abduction basically is the, has to do with the fact of creating something new. According to Peirce, you couldn't create something new from induction. He had his own take on induction. And of course, not from deduction that goes by, uh, uh, by definition. So it comes through abduction. So what does abduction come from? Well, according to Peirce, human beings have this inborn capacity to think and theorize. And here is an example. Just as a chicken knows what to pick up from the ground and eat, so humans are able to think with ease about certain phenomena and explain this. So, you know, it's pretty much what cognitive scientists say today. You know, that's, you know, babies can explain things. You know, they understand causality or, you know, they improve on their early notion of causality, etc. The one who introduced me, the first time I ever heard Peirce's name mentioned was, you know, uh, Noam Chomsky. And Noam Chomsky basically 
takes the line of purse. So, you know, it's pretty heavy guns who are involved here. So basically, this is a kind of biological capacity abduction, but you still can sort of influence its fringes, let's put it that way, you know. And he has this capacity to be extremely scientific. He was trained as a chemist and a physicist and so on and so forth, but also be very much into what the pragmatists were interested in, namely creating different habits of thought. So you can see here that he has some exercises. You have to sort of like somehow, you can't change your subconscious, but you want to be a little bit more in contact with it. So here is what you do. Walks at dawn and dusk are recommended, you know. And then, you know, there are also certain things that you do that you have this resistance to, right? And it's horrible to do certain statistical analysis and so on. For that, he recommended weightlifting, you know. You have all, you know, bench pressing, whatever it's called, you know. So he's full of this mixture of superb intelligence, you know, like, He's really a competitor. He's really in the class of Leibniz and, you know, Aristotle. And, you know, no sociologist was ever close to that. So, so he's a very interesting kind of guy. What am now my thing is, let's see if this one works. Oh, here we go. So here, this is to tell you a little bit more about abduction. And I've also, you can see the first three points is about abduction. So, you know, from what I've said, you might think that abduction is something that just pops into your head. And of course, that's what it does, but it's a little bit more than that. And then I have filled it out with four and five, which is how he saw the whole research process. Now, he's a natural scientist. He wrote a little bit about economics and so on and so forth. But basically, you know, he obviously doesn't have the fishy and a meaning approach that comes with Max Weber and so on and so forth. So, First thing is observe, observation, but also he adds to be hopeful. Why does he say that? Well, if you're in science as a vocation, you know that. In any kind of research, you know, if it's true research, you don't really know what you're going to find. If you do know what you're going to find, well, it's not that innovative, <coughs> unfortunately. So you, sh you have to just go into that with a hope that there is something there. And then you should focus on what surprises you. So the thing is that there are all of these stories about what should a sociologist, social scientist focus on. You should focus on a problem. You should focus on a paradox and so on. Percy's notion, you know, I'm not saying he's right, but he has an interest in your points. You should focus on what surprises you. What surprises you? Well, if you are trained in sociology, you expect, or whatever, you expect certain things to happen. Well, if they don't happen, you're onto something. That's what the surprise is. The third point is known as economy of research. I'm sort of pretty cold to that, but it's basically, he says that, you know, there are these things that you have a certain amount of time, you have a certain amount of money and so on to spend on it. So you have to sort of like work with that. So now you have had, so you can see that abduction is really the creative element. It's the most valuable part. Without that, you are nothing. Okay, that's point one. Point two, is that Per says also that without having tested your idea, you don't have anything either. So it's both that the abduction is the valuable idea, but before having tested it. So how do you test it? Well, you take your idea and you translate it into hypothesis. So this, you know, don't start with a hypothesis. They come after you have the idea. And then you have your hypothesis, and now you test them against data. And that's what Peirce calls induction. He thinks that if you start out with induction, you can lie yourself to anything. You know, a little bit like the big data people. You know, just have a lot of data, and then you run something through it, and something will come out. It always does, but then, you know, something else can come out also, so that's not too good. So this is one of the persons that I really recommend you to read. I mean, he's just wonderful. You know, he will, your head will be flying high up over the earth when you read him. So here is my teacher, Everett C. Hughes, who wrote The Sociological Eye. And he was very good on free associations, you know. So to sort of like when you, both in the theory part and when you sort of like try to get a handle on what you're really studying, he is sort of advocating that you should train yourself in associations. I have Wittgenstein here, and the reason for that is, as you know, sociologists the classical sociologists were not interested in language. Doesn't exist in Karl Marx. In Durkheim, you have collective representations. In Weber, you have meaning. None have language, right? So that you're sort of missing something about the human social existence. So the one who really brings it back, I think, is 
Wittgenstein. And Wittgenstein is extremely good on descriptions. I mean, he's really in a very tortured way. You know, don't think, but look. He's into doing really what is going on there. And then also this very, very peculiar, delicate, difficult part of language that plays in it. So, you know, Wittgenstein is also, I, you know, you are a British audience. I think British sociologists read, well, there are well-known British sociologists who have taken a lot of good ideas from Wittgenstein. In the US, you know, he is, well, uh, you know, it's as popular as Karl Marx, you know, something like that. So <laughs> here you have C. Wright Mills, and of course, you know, all of us read and think that the sociological imagination is wonderful, you know, bravo, you know. And of course, at the time, he was a pariah, C. Wright Mills, right? I mean, he attacked his colleagues at Columbia University. They wanted pretty much to execute him, you know. But today, of course, all of those people are dead, including C. Wright Mills. She does have a delightful book. What is interesting, though, is, is that the concept of imagination is really understudied, you know. And that's, you want to know what it is, you know, both for yourself and also to make studies. So I think that is a focus on that. The only one I found who actually says something interesting on imagination is Jean-Paul Sartre, who's written two books about it, which were really clever books. Here is another person. So far in theorizing, I haven't really addressed sort of like the model builders. And one really great book on this topic is by Jim March and Charles Lay, called An Introduction to Models in the Social Sciences. And what the book is mainly about is to teaching the students to learn how to speculate. So speculation is a topic that is very little talked about in sociology, and if it is, it's seen as, you know, about as interesting as theology, and right? you know, as unsuitable as the theology for social science. But they really make a really good case for it, uh, Jim March and Leif. They're also, you know, in a very clever way, the book is written in a very clever way, so I make the argument we should have exercises for the students, it's just like in methods, you know, it's something you have to learn to do, like swimming. What March and Leif are doing, which is very cool, is that when you read the book, they're sort of one, taking you through problems, and then they say, stop and think in fat black, you know, italics and so on. And the reason for that, they explain with their cleverness as Gresham's law of studies, you know, Gresham's law about how, you know, people are sort of like keeping the good coins and shipping, you know, using the bad coins. They are arguing that the same thing with reading and thinking. So most of us know how to read, you know, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, you know, now we have read the whole book. Thinking is something else, so they are arguing that, you know, reading is a well-defined technology and it basically drives out thinking. So the book is sort of full with these really cool little clever ideas. So the models they are introducing you to are models like diffusion, adaptation, choice, so it's you know, it's from psychology, economics, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and of course you would think, although, you know, I'm not a model builder, but you would think that in a really good course in theorizing, you would also cover model building, right? I mean, you don't want the students just to know one, two models and then apply it to everything, like in microeconomics, you know, the demand supply or something like that. You want them to sort of like know how to build a model and then, of course, how to confront it with data. I think that, you know, a big difference today and when the theory construction movement existed in the 1960s and 1970s is that we have cognitive science today. So I've al already mentioned the importance of things like, you know, analogies and concepts. I mentioned that people are born with, you know, uh, capacity to explain. Well, sociologists don't know anything about this. They don't study it. It's cognitive scientists who do it. They have studied concepts empirically for 40, 50 years, and you cannot find, you know, one. I'm sure you can find one, but you can't find one study of concepts. You know, what is a concept? What does it do, etc. You can find a million articles about the notion of power or something like that. You know, just go down the, the line for that. So, we are sociologists, how do we know cognitive science? Well, you know, there exists a lot of good handbooks in it. I mean, there's a tradition in the area to summarize all the minute studies that are being done, and here are two of them, a Cambridge and Oxford handbook of cognitive science. So, you know, there of course are, you know, problems with cognitive science from the viewpoint of sociology. They don't contextualize, they are universal and so on. But, you know, we're sociologists, we can handle that. So, you know. 
Now I'm coming close to the end here and I can't even see what the last line is myself, so I guess that was something important that we will forget about. <laughs> but anyway, so the summary is that, you know, theorizing is important, so think a little bit about it. And I think that the people who teach theory, you know, owe up to the fact that you learn these things much better through exercises. I mean, try to develop exercises for the students. They are not only confronted with the fact that they are not as smart as Max Weber or something like that. And, you know, when you do these things, there are a lot, many things to think about, probably many I haven't mentioned, but you need to know sort of what concepts are, what metaphors are. You have to know what an analogy is. What's the difference between a surface analogy and a structural analogy? You know, these kind of things. These are important. And, oops, here we go here. So, you should also learn to do, I think, things that we should learn to do things for heuristic reasons. I mean, we're being taught all the time, like good school children, that this is the way to behave and that's the wrong way to behave. You can do a lot of things just to come up with good ideas. It's a different kind of ball game. You can do the wrong thing to come up with good ideas, etc. And you also, since theorizing uh, is really about you know, your own personal capacity, you have to really sort of like study yourself, you know, you have to be reflexive in a non bourdieu way and study sort of like what you're good at, what you're bad at. You know, when I teach theorizing and theorizing exercises, I tell the student, you're going to fail, you know, it's okay, you know, that's fine. You have to learn to fail, you have to know what you're bad at, what you're good at, so you can know how to improve it, etc. And, you know, once you sort of get closer to that, you should get into these different work habits. I mean, there are certain parts of the research process where you have to be very methodical, very logical. There are certain parts of the research process where you're not, where it's, you have to be creative, where you have to let your mind go in the dusk and dawn with Charles Peirce. <laughs> so here is the last, that's the last slide. So the talk is over. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, you doing weightlifting this? Yeah, I, I don't do weightlifting, I'm incidentally, <laughs> but you might Inch see that. Pressing Swedberg. Asparagus I, arms. I never guessed. Uh, okay, any questions from the audience, please? Got a few lining up, so uh, we'll start with uh, Lydia, please. <laughs> Right. Or whether you'd say it's basically the same as abduction. Well, uh, Karin Orsatina has a very nice piece on intuition in that book, Theorizing in the Social Sciences, and she talks a lot about it and have examples from neuroscience and so on and so forth. So, I mean, what we don't really know is does intuition exist, you know? So, I mean, if we sort of start with Durkheim, I mean, Durkheim's first point is that sociologists you know, have to break with a pre, pre notion with a preconceived notion. So it's not so clear that we really have something called intuition. There's something going on there. So I mean, I prefer more to talk about sort of like, I think people do have a subconscious, not an unconscious, but a subconscious. And I think that you can access parts of it, not all of that. And I think that that would probably fall into uh, the area of what you call intuition. If one then looks at it from another viewpoint, I mean like the Weber's very pragmatic viewpoint, which is that, you know, it doesn't really matter what concept you use as long as you say something smart. So, you know, if you can sort of like get at it from the way you see intuition and how it is being defined, you know, all power to you, that kind of stuff. So that, a little bit like that. Uh, but I mean, there's a tendency to sort of like have simple solutions to things. And I mean, if you read the cognitive science literature, I mean, according to Chomsky, you know, they are really sort of pre-Galilean cognitive science. And you know, Chomsky is smart, you know, and that probably is the case. I mean, there's a lot of these terms floating around and it's very easy to attach to one of them. But I think, you know, being a bit skeptical at the same time as one makes one's move could be useful, yeah. And there was a question just next to Lydia. Uh, I'm afraid that this is not just, as you put it, the overwhelming role of methods today that uh, discourages theorizing. It is, I would argue, the rushed and perfunctory way of confronting the world which appears to in a 
permanent flux th that we live in every day. So the task would be, and I do not know how, how, how to do it, to convince our students that, um, that, it is, that going slower and deeper is good for their minds and for their characters, perhaps. Your, your multi-step way of looking at things, you called it submerging oneself totally in them, takes time. They are all in a rush. In addition and important, and I shush in a moment, uh, our programs, university programs, only speed it up. I teach at the University of Essex. Our master's students have one year to complete their master's uh, dissertation, how to do a pre-study. So you see both the, the gallop of the world and what follows at the institutional level make it extremely difficult. I, I'm all for theorizing. This is how I was brought up intellectually by these youngsters. Well, I mean, the general time argument is sort of, you know, of course you need time to become smart in anything. But I mean, a lot of students today in the US where I work, I mean, you basically look for a data set, you know, then you work with a data set. Well, that's not the way you sort of study something. So you have to sort of like break out of that kind of thing. I mean, Tocqueville, in, when he writes, you know, Tocqueville's book, Democracy in America, is a very good sociological study. And Tocqueville, already in that, as well as in his book on the French Revolution, sort of has this preference for developing the data himself rather than use other people's data. So that's the point I'm making. So, you know, of course things take time, etc. But I mean, you know, I, I do, th I, I sort of like don't really see how the time argument is, you know, if you want to cut something out, cut out Habermas, that would be my thing <laughs> in that case, you know. Uh, I mean, you know, it just keeps adding up, right, the smart people. I mean, those of us who are intellectuals and sort of like to read Norbert Elias or Habermas, et cetera, it just becomes more and more and more. And they're also very demanding, the literature. Now you have the Max Weber Gesamtausgabe, which is more than, I think it's 44 volumes. They are very good. The introductions are very good. So that will mean that it will take you between 11 and 42 years to know Max Weber well. So, you know. So, I mean, I would actually be much more friendly to sort of like picking random people. I mean, sort of like at least you get, let's say, go into Weber rather than also Zimmel and Durkheim or whatever. I mean, picking one or two. Durkheim himself said that that's how he learned to be good. You take a good master and you pick him apart. It was Emile Boutreau, who was a Kantian philosopher. So the thing is that you know, I would think that if you have this time restraint, you really want to go for quality, you know, rather than uh, the ever more uh, thing. So, uh, yeah, that would be my answer. I meant the mindset also, you see. What, what do you mean with the mindset the then? The mindset, the life orientation to gallop. In what the sense? The I mean, that, what, what do you mean with life the orientation? The quicker I do it, the wiser I be, you see. That's, uh, the quicker I do it, Well, some of us are very quick. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm sort of quick and superficial, so. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I do think that, you know, that maybe I would, you know, meet you halfway on the point that I think that sociology actually is a certain mindset. And I think a lot of people come into sociology because they think that they want to change the world and you know, there's a lot of unhappiness here and there. And it's actually, I think, quite far away from what sociology is about. And it takes you a pretty long time to sort of like get into that mode. So, you know, that, that would be my uh, unsatisfactory answer, yes. <laughs> someone who's just started out as a PhD student myself, I would, would like it if you could flesh out the first section of your little steps about how to theorize. So the observation section, you know, how do you do that? How do you, do you just use the sort of instances of whatever you're studying that are right in front of you? Or do you go out and search for new ones? Do you, once you've looked at something, to sort of help you theorize, do you go to a new source of data to try and test it out? I don't know, I'd, I'd like, yeah, I'd like to hear more about that. 
Well, I mean, I teach classes in theorizing, and the way I'll describe it, not because they're so great, but to sort of like give you a sense for it. So, I mean, the basic idea then is that the student has to go through these different steps. And they are students, you sort of learn them first, like learning to drive a car, you know, sort of like, I can't drive a car either, but you know, I can imagine what it's like, so to speak. <laughs> I've been in cabs, you know, but anyway. so. What the theorizing courses looks like is that you start out by letting the students read a little bit about what theorizing is so they get a little handle of it. And then I have three cycles of theorizing. This is how the American term system is worked out. So in each of these three kind of cycles, they will, to the first of three uh, meetings, they will first observe something and also give it a name. So they can take whatever they want, you know, if they want to talk to their grandparents or their friends or go downtown in Ithaca where I live or go on the web or do something statistical, whatever it is, they have to focus in on something without coming up with a theory and preferably also something they are not good at. So the students always want to write papers about what they already know, which sort of prevents them from learning something new. And you know, it's much better to take something very far from them, I tell them. So the that's the first of the three sessions, to study something. And often when you study something, it turns out it's different from what you think. So you sort of gravitate to what is interesting, and you learn to have some knowledge of it without a theory of it. At the most, you try to give it a name, sort of like this is an odd kind of thing. What should I call it? Now, the second meeting is, is that the student will try to build a little bit of the body of the thing, maybe develop a typology, maybe use an analogy or a metaphor to sort of like try to give it body. And the third time, they come up with an explanation. So it's a cycle, observation, building out the theory to explanation. And the term system is such that I have three such exercises. If the term system was different, I would have 42 exercises. The basic idea is just if you do it several times, you sort of like learn what to do. So the students for each of this time, I've only done this with graduate students, that small numbers of students, eight to 10. So when they come to class, each student gets actually 10 minutes to say what they have been studying and what they have been doing so they can listen to each other. What invariably happens is that the students get stuck on different kind of, you know, the first part or the second part. They are really good in the beginning. They lose interest or whatever it is. But that's how it is. So that's how you're supposed to learn this. And then for the grade, I tell them in the beginning that you'll all pass. I'm not interested in the grades. If you do the work, you'll all pass. You know, I'm not, you know, who is smart, you'll figure it out in different ways. And life will tell you also. So, but for the final task, they do what I call an autoethnography. And that is that they describe in 15, 20 pages how they fared during these three exercises. What they failed in, what they were good at, why they failed in it, etc. Now, that's, that's basically, so this is one way of doing exercise. Could I do it for undergraduates? I've never done it. Then you have like 40, 60 people in the room. You can't give everybody 10 minutes and so on and so forth. So, you know, the limits, I'm not saying this is so great. I'm more explaining it. Now, what I can say is that I've taught normal theory for a long time. And usually the students write pretty boring papers. You know, it takes a long time to really get that, what is really clever in Max Weber or Durkheim or Zimmel or something like that. Hard theoreticians, you know, you have to work through many layers. When I do the theorizing thing, they are very much alive, the papers. They are extremely readable. They are very, very interesting kind of papers. Now, earlier I did a podcast interview, and in that one I described one example. I thought it was very clever by a student just now at Cornell. And then afterwards I thought, oh my God, you know, I'm doing this in an interview. Maybe she wanted to keep those ideas, etc. So I don't really, for next time I do a public lecture, 
I'll ask the students. I can't really give it. But they are very much alive, the students. And the reason for it is that, you know, everybody's interested in themselves. I mean, the first great love is yourself, right? So they really want to develop themselves and, you know, be smart and study themselves. It's a natural kind of thing to do. So, you know, that's how you do it. So the basic idea is to do this a couple of times, in my case three. By that time, you sort of get the rhythm of it. Once you're good at it, then like when you drive a car, quote unquote, you can sort of stop thinking about, you can sort of notice what's going on, right? I mean, you can, you know, you can, my, maybe also not so good for driving, but you can reverse the moves a little bit and that kind of stuff. You can play around with it. But in the beginning, you have, that's why I talk about steps. In the beginning, you have to sort of like, you have to start with observation. That I will insist. You have to be a sociologist, but if you don't start with observation, you know, then you're dead as far as I'm concerned. And I can even prove it because society is changing all the time. I mean, what else did Karl Marx teach us than that the accumulation of capital changes the world? So, you know, even if Weber was Mr. Wonderful, which is not, you know, the world since 1920 is very different from the one that Max Weber lived through. Yes, here. I was very, uh... Uplifting. Took a lot of weight off our shoulders, I have to say, <laughs> after the sort of uh, methodological sadism of things like theoretical practice. Um, the question I've got is, do you have a recommendation on discards in the sense that... Um, on what? Discards or discarding evidence in that you're reading a big book, which you've recommended us not to do. Right. And, for instance, let me give an example. <coughs> I was reading uh, a very large book on Renaissance banking with a sort of theoretical idea of why do they go bust all the time. Right. And, um, and then I, uh, two days later I thought that bit which made me chuckle was when they set up a bank, in, this was in Venice, they walk down the Rialto, they play musical instruments and they wave banners and they tip out a load of gold coins on a table, and that's a new bank. And I thought, hmm. And I didn't make any notes on that. And then it came back to me two days later. I thought, no, actually, that's quite key. You know, that's how they set up banks. Mm. And it's not terribly convincing for me, but it must have been quite a splash at the time. And so I've held on to that. But the point is, I nearly discarded it. So therefore, you know, if you're in this observational s stage and we do read far too much, that means we're discarding a lot and probably discarding some wrong things. Well, yeah, that's true. But you also pick up a lot through your subconscious. And I mean, obviously, you picked something up there which sort of enervated you a little bit. You know, it's like the detective stories, right? There's something that in that scene that is annoying me. And on page 250, they figure out what it is. So I mean, that's why you really have, I think, to access your subconscious a little bit in order to find all of those discards and stuff like that. I mean, that would be my uh, response to that. I mean, I often, you know, I study myself, so I often read an article or a book, and then I underline the important things. You know, I'm sort of very Puritan, you know, Lutheran, Sweden, and so on and so forth. And then I notice, you know, that the thing I really remember about the book and liked is something totally different, you know. <laughs> so, you know, so there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. I mean, we have, you know, remember one of the definitions of uh, uh, what a social fact in is Durkheim is like ways of thinking. So, I mean, in a sense, we have the enemy inside our head, right? I mean, it's like Cain says that the problem is not to come up with new ideas, to get rid of old ideas that are really holding us on a grip. And I think that the, that's where the Wittgensteinian observation is. There's a lot of things going on in front of your nose, you know, and you think, it's something totally different. I mean, it's really remarkable when you have those kind of experiences. So it all, I think, boils down to this, to be sort of like very interactive with your own mind and sort of like study yourself and be, you know, that kind of stuff. That would be my, I, I like your example with the banks though, you know, that is sort of like, uh, uh, cute, you know. Uh, well, you know, they have a whole architecture, they used to have an architecture of banking that just gets stability, right? I mean, you have a lot of pillars and all of that, and today you don't have banks any longer. You have sort of supermarkets of money or something like that, and as Nigel uh, just reminded me of, also the whole relationship to money is just like totally different, you know, with bitcoins and all of that. It was a one sentence in a 600-page book. <laughs> 
Well, you know, you pick it up where you can pick it up, right? I mean, if you think about it, there is an enormous amount of impressions that we all have all the time, and we just single out a little bit of it, but the rest is sort of like somewhere there, you know? So uh, the sentence for you it did a good work, so somehow you picked it up. A question just there. Uh, Richard, thank you for a, a really thought-provoking um, presentation. I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit on how you think social scientists should engage, connect with existing theories and concepts, particularly mm -hmm. where theory that of concepts, existing, existing theories, and concepts. theories and concepts. Well, it's sort of like I mean, the story is basically this: that you have a theory of concept in the Western world till pretty much 1950s or something, when Wittgenstein comes in and says, with the example of game, that you know you can't have necessary and sufficient conditions. That's not what concepts are. You know, and that is picked up by cognitive scientists. They read Wittgenstein, which is sort of impressive, and they start then doing a lot of studies of how people use concepts, and they find that they really use them in a kind of, you know, family resemblance way. You know, you have, you know, you don't have necessary and sufficient conditions. You, you know, you just have sort of the sufficient conditions, right? And there are lots of different theories of this uh, exemplar theory, you know, and so on and so forth. Now, what they haven't studied, which we are in a sense interested in, is the way scientists use concepts. So is that the same as common people use concepts? Well, presumably not. I mean, it's a more stylized way, but you know, till there are more studies of how scientists really use them, we would suspect that that kind of weird shifting of meanings actually goes on also among social scientists. So this sort of leads us to the question of, which is another topic that should be taught in classes of theorizing, is what are definitions? And definitions, there's a whole literature on different kinds of definitions. There's a lexical definition, you know, you are in France and, you know, you see whatever word it is, you look it up and, you know, you don't get the subtleties, but you know that that means a subway or a, you know, boulangerie or whatever it can be. So that's a lexical definition. Now there's something called a stipulative definition. And the stipulative definition is just that I decide what the concept is in my article with lots of clarity. So at least for this article, I will, you know, this is what I mean by class, or this is what I mean by status. So I think that what's going on is, is that there are these two different things. We don't, really, we don't really know what a concept is. It's a wonderful kind of thing that human beings have, you know, like part of language or whatever. So that's one thing, that a lot of studies being done in the area, and one should be keyed into it. But on the other hand, I think that, you know, for your practical research, you need particularly in the context of justification, you need clarity. Mm -hmm. And the clarity you get through this stipulative thing, you just say it straight out. There were, interestingly enough, in the 1940s and 50s, committees in political science and in sociology that tried to determine the, 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 what the different concepts meant. They produced reports and long lists of concepts, and it was sort of like given up because it was sort of like futile. I mean, it was sort of like didn't lead anywhere. So we are sort of caught in between this that we still don't know that much about concept. On the other hand, we want to be as clear as we possibly could. That's my current answer to it. Uh, I, I, sorry, I just wondered if you could clarify in this process that you've elaborated, these different steps that, w that a social scientist should go through in theorizing, when should that happen, in your opinion? When should social, so social scientists engage with existing ideas and concepts and theories? When they should engage? With I don't existing feel. theory. Yeah. Or with the existing yeah, theory. <laughs> at, what, at, what stage, at what stage in that process that you've elaborated this evening? Well, you know, I mean, I think one can talk around it in a lot of ways. I mean. The, you know, the, the non-expected answer is that I think that it is actually rather, you know, it's a bit of an obstacle to know too much when you do your research, you know. <laughs> so this is called Mental Hygiene by August Comte, and everybody sort of laughs at it, but it's actually rather smart. So, I mean, as a rule, it's much better to, and that has been also experiments on this in cognitive science, that it's better for you to formulate your own answer first, because then you are really ready to see, the, to see the theory and see what the difference is. You know, you sort of see it very clearly. If you do it the other way, the little sort of originality most of us have is sort of like gets lost also. So Tocqueville, 
you know, and I wrote a book on Tocqueville, when he traveled through the United States, he very carefully avoided reading a certain kind of literature on the United States for this very reason. He traveled with his friend Gustave de Beaumont, and since he was very clever, he said to Gustave, you read the literature, and if it's something that is very important for me, you tell me about it. So, I mean, so that's one, you know, so obviously that's not really what you necessarily are after. I mean, Students sometimes tell me, or other people say that, well, if you do it like this, you just Im you know, end up with reinventing the wheel. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the answer is, you know, the wheel was pretty important. If you're smart enough to reinvent it, it's pretty good. It's not what you do when you want to publish articles. But in the beginning, you know, it gives you self-confidence. And I mean, self-confidence is the whole issue here. I mean, in what is enlightenment in the, you know, in the 1700s by Immanuel Kant, he says that, you know, there are these guardians who tell you what to think. Mm -hmm. And they say, don't think for yourself. We'll think for you. You know, and then he says, but you really shouldn't listen to them. And when you don't listen to them, you'll make a lot of mistakes. But, you know, after a couple of falls on your face, you'll, you know, come up and you'll have the confidence. So I think that things like confidence building in the students is just as important. If you then sort of say, well, Norbert Elias made a study of that in 1946, so goodbye to you. You know, that's like... These are sort of like, there's so much social science now, right? So, I mean, if you go on the web, you can probably find pretty much most things having been said if you're going to really push the point. So uh, that's a little bit the rambling answer I would give. I, I don't hear that well. That's why I sort of misunderstood you. But, you know, that sort of creative misunderstandings. I hope it was one of those. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Richard. That, we've come to 8 o'clock, uh, so uh, I think we have to finish, I'm afraid. But thank you for a very entertaining and sometimes controversial talk.